Ready. Ready. All right, good evening, and uh, welcome to our Wednesday evening Bible study. We're going to be covering Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 26. It'll be a continuation of what we've been studying on Wednesday nights. And, and I asked the guys to come in and just kind of help do some discussion with it. So we're going to talk through uh, the questions that we're going to have out on uh, Facebook and text to you as well. So uh, um, if you want to take your time, turn to your Bibles and look at Luke chapter 6, verse 12, starting in verse 12. I want to just mention this, though, before we get going. Uh, we've, we've got uh, some DVDs of the services, uh, Sunday morning services, Wednesday evening discussions, and, and uh, Sunday night, and also some devotions. Uh, we've got those recorded off, and if you know of someone that is not able to get the material online and would like to have them to be able to watch, then please send me a text and let me know, and we will try to make sure that those get uh, dispersed out to everyone. So just kind of keep that in mind and, and feel free to, to send me that message about them. So Luke chapter 6, uh, let me pray before we get started, and then we'll look at our text. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you. Lord, we thank you for this day you've given us. Uh, Lord, we continue to just pray for all of those who are working in the medical profession, the, the first responders, all those who are dealing with the illness that is going on. Lord, we pray that you give them protection. We pray that you give them safety. Lord, we pray for our governmental leaders, our school leaders, uh, for our, our, uh, all of those who are having to make some difficult decisions through this time. We pray, Lord, that you would just uh, give them the wisdom that they need. Lord, we pray for all of the the students, uh, college down through high school and elementary school, and Lord, we just pray that you give them a peace and a calm about all things that are now different in their life. Lord, most of all, we just want to thank you for your goodness to us. In times like this, we're reminded of all that you've blessed us with, and Lord, we pray that we not take that for granted. We love you. We thank you for your son who died for us, and it's in his name we pray. Amen. All right, Luke chapter 6, verse 12 uh, says, in these days he went out to the mountain to pray, and all night he continued in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom he named apostles, Simon, who he named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, and Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and, and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all the crowd sought to touch him, for power came out from him and healed them all. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. And blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For so their fathers did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you shall be hungry. And woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. And woe to you when all people speak well of you, for so their fathers did to the false prophets. As we look at, at this text, we find a time, a very important time in Jesus' ministry, where he actually calls the twelve and identifies them to be his apostle. An apostle being different from a disciple in that there were only 12, uh, 13 if you count Paul, uh, apostles. And I guess you could say 14 because Judas Iscariot was um, actually committed suicide after he betrayed Christ. And then they replaced him with Matthias. And so you have Matthias being the replacement for the 12, uh, the twelfth, and then you have Paul that would become an apostle later on after his Damascus Road experience. So a very limited number of apostles. Those were individuals that had special knowledge of Christ because they walked with him. But then there was a lot of disciples, and this is a large group of disciples who are gathered here. We don't know exactly the, the size of the crowd, but verse 17 says a great crowd of his disciples. So there were many people that followed him 
at this point in time. Now, there would be some that would turn away uh, later on when Christ begins some of his very difficult teaching. But in this moment, we find he calls these 12 to be his apostles. And, and as we look uh, down into verse 20, we find some, some interesting teaching that would be eye-opening uh, for some people that was gathered there. So let's look at our questions and use that to kind of walk through our uh, text tonight and kind of some discussion with it. So the first question that we have says, why do you think that at this particular point in Scripture, verse 12, uh, why do you think Luke mentions that Jesus prayed all night? So uh, this was all indications we have of this is that that Jesus literally prayed all night. It wasn't a, he prayed till late at night or, or early in the morning, but he, he literally prayed all night. So why do you think it's in, that Luke felt it to be important to mention it at this point in time? Well, this was just before he would call the disciples or apostles to follow him. So it would be important if he's about to make a huge decision that would affect the rest of his ministry, that he would be in tune with God's will. Okay. It shows the significance of praying for decisions like that, but also daily that um, which is an example for us that that our our dependence needs to be on God daily um, you know, this had to be hard because you got Judas Iscariot that is going to betray him uh, Christ knew that he was you know it's identified earlier that Christ knew he was a thief from the beginning uh, or identified later I should say so you know, this has got to be a hard decision. And if you're thinking about as Christ is praying all night, this may have been a situation where he and God talked about several different names of people. You know, it says there's a great crowd of disciples here. They may have talked about several different people before they, they actually settled on this 12. We don't know if they did or not, but it could have been possible. So um, we're not privy to what the prayer was. We just know that they did. So question two then, uh, what should this teach us about our prayer life and what does John 15, 5 tell us? So I'm going to flip over to John 15, 5. If you guys want to kind of talk about the first part of that. We mentioned it a little bit. But. I think that it should teach us that we need to be in constant prayer, like you said, just the dependence that we should have on prayer in our lives. also shows the importance of not making hasteful decisions or rush decisions, but that we should slow down and think about things and take them to God and be open to what His plan is or what He would be guiding us or leading us towards. And this, this wasn't just a, a time where Jesus said, God, I just need you to give me the names. <laughs> but, I mean, it, to pray all night means that they were in, in deep discussion about what was going on. And, and sometimes we we tend to, to have, and not that God doesn't hear our short prayer, because that's fine for us to do, but, but there are times, especially on decisions you're talking about, that, that we really need to spend some, some dedicated time in prayer in order to know exactly what, what his decision would be, uh, or his direction would be. Um, John fifteen five actually says that, I am the vine, you are the branches, whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. And, and the reason I threw that in there was just that, that um, if we try to go at life on our own and, and we remove God or remove Christ, that was actually Christ speaking that, if we remove Christ or remove God from the equation, then we're relying on our own wisdom. And, and when we fail to pray or uh, be in prayer over time, then we, we lean on our own understanding. And, and this, I mean, says to us that apart from him, we can really do nothing. That doesn't mean that, that we sit in a chair and we don't do anything. It just means that, that there's nothing that we can accomplish for the kingdom uh, without leaning upon their guidance and their direction. So I think it's important for us to, to know. Question three, did any of the 12 ask to asked to be or request to be one of the apostles that Jesus selected. No. No, we don't find any any recording of that. The only thing we, we find, and this is later, but the mother of two of them actually come to Christ and, and request a special place for, for her sons. And, and um, you know, Christ doesn't buy into that very well. But 
but they had no idea. You know, th there's no indication that these guys knew that they were going to be called by Christ. And, and I think in our life that, that means something to us because uh, we get kind of surprised sometimes when something falls to us that, that it appears to be a God-directed thing. And yet we kind of are blindsided by it. And, and I think these guys were probably very unaware of what he was calling them, uh, that he was going to call them, and then what he was actually calling them to, which I think kind of plays into what we see there starting in verse 20. Uh, question four, what does Acts 4.13 tell us about these men, and what does this mean to us? So Acts 4.13 you all got it memorized? Not quite. Not. Uh, well, we'll work on that next week. <laughs> all right, Acts 4.13 says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated common men, they were astonished and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. I think it shows that uh, God is willing to use anyone, not just the people that have been studying the the, the Bible since they were six years old and have half of it memorized, but he's willing to use anyone, whether they seem weak or small in stature, to use for his will. Okay. I'd say it also shows that regardless of where we are in our life or we feel stuck or like our job is meaningless or different things like that, that God can take that and guide us down a path for what we do, we'll have an impact for his kingdom and provide a sense of fulfillment. Okay. I, you know, I think, and, and you mentioned education, and we can find fulfillment doing what God's will is for regardless of who we are. Um, I think it, it's also important for us to know that we don't have to have a special talent either. You know, these were uneducated. They were just common men. They weren't upper echelon people. They weren't the, the, the most uh, well-known even people. Well, one of them was was probably well known, but not in a good way, and that was Matthew being a tax collector. People knew who he was, they didn't like him though. So this shows us that we don't have to be that that big name person in order to, to be a, a big part of God's plan. These 12 were a huge part of God's plan, and, and yet they were somewhat no name people. So, um, Question five, is it easier for God's extraordinary power to be on display in someone that is unusually gifted or for it to be on display in someone that is just, and I use the word ordinary there, I put it in quotation, or, uh, yeah, quotation marks. And I don't mean that to be derogatory, I just mean someone that's just kind of a common, ordinary person. So which one do you think it's easier for God's extraordinary power to be on display in? Uh, definitely an ordinary person. Because if it's someone that's naturally talented, even though the talent comes from God, they can say, look what I did, like that was for me. But if you look at someone like David, for instance, uh, from the Old Testament, he was the smallest, the youngest, the least handsome of his brothers, and he was used to defeat Goliath. He was used to be the king of Israel. You know, um, they, no one was expecting him to be anointed the next king, so it was very out of the ordinary. It's not derogatory towards people that are naturally gifted or have abilities though because God gave them those abilities. Yeah. So just because they have those abilities doesn't mean that they're absolutely full of bragging. Yeah. And and God uses those people too. So we don't want to discount that, like you're saying. Um but sometimes, you know, we get this idea that that we don't have talent to do anything in his kingdom and yet sometimes God magnifies our inability uh, so much that that he's glorified through that just if we're willing to step out and do you know whatever he's called us to do or, or laid upon our heart to do um, question six from verse 17 who did Jesus come down with so let's answer that first so verse 17 who did he come down with it says them but who's them uh, his apostles and disciples okay so he came down with them and uh, who do you think that Jesus was primarily addressing the Beatitudes toward? That's that's what's found in verses 20 through 23. Who do you think he was primarily addressing those things toward? In verse 20 says, And he lifted up his eyes on his, on his disciples. 
like he was looking at them and not necessarily the crowd, but he looked at the twelve apostles to speak to them. And he was also speaking to the crowd, but this is especially a message towards them since they were being called to a greater service, had more responsibility, more consequences. And probably even breaking those disciples down even more magnified to his apostles that he just called. Right. Because they're they're kind of wondering probably what okay, what does this apostle thing mean? You know, if if Christ calls you out and says, Okay, you twelve are gonna be like a special group, okay, what does that mean? <laughs> you know. Um so yeah, I think he's it's a directed and and I think uh, when we were talking earlier, one of you guys mentioned, you know, that, that it's also directed even toward us today. Um, so this is it's not just directed at one particular person, but at that point in time, there was a primary audience, and it was probably those apostles and disciples that were gathered there so that they would just kind of know what it meant to be a follower of Christ. And, and he talks about some things here that are just kind of um, uh, just not what you would have expected to heard out of someone that they thought was going to establish a kingdom on earth. I so this is especially the case in a Roman society because pride was a big thing there. Mm -hmm. And people placed value on pride and doing things that made you look good or being a soldier, being these different things. All these things were prideful and stuff that they were proud of. And Christ is basically call them, calling them to be the exact opposite of that be the exact opposite of what that society was calling them to be. And, you know, even if you go back to his birth, uh, from the time of the announcement of his birth all the way through the time of his birth, God didn't use the people that were extraordinary, but he used the common, ordinary person. You know, the, the shepherds are the ones that the angels appeared to. Shepherds were, the, you know, they were not thought of very highly. And... And yet, the angels appear to them and give them the message to go and to find, you know, the Christ child was born that night, and and so they do. Um, and then you find, you know, the the wise men, which were respected people in that day and time, and they actually come and bow down to him. You know, so it's just kind of a, it, it, like you said, in that society, it's just kind of a different, different than what they were accustomed to. And uh, of course, the the Jewish community was looking for this kingdom that was going to be established that would lead them out of this Roman rule that they were under and what they're getting is something totally different than what they expected so, um, question 7 reading the Beatitudes at face value verses 20 through 23 how inviting is it uh, how inviting is it to be uh, one whom Jesus says is blessed and so just kind of taking Again, when I say reading at face value, what I'm meaning is is someone that may not be a Christian, may not ever set foot in a church before, and they open the Bible, and they just happen to fall to, to this section of, of text, and they start reading, and they say, Blessed are you when you're poor. Blessed are you who hunger now. Uh, blessed are you who weep now. Blessed are you when people hate you. Uh, how does that sound, just reading it at face value? I mean, it would be very much a... Uh discouragement if you were just like happened to open to that random part of the Bible yeah. like to read I would that. say or shortly after you become a Christian or follower of Christ as well reading through this could be discouraging saying okay there may be rough times ahead which which is another example of why it's important for us to when we read scripture to really dig into the meaning of it and not just read it at face value and walk away from it but but really look at what they're talking about here. And the Beatitudes are a great example of that because we have to, to dig into what he's really getting at here in order to understand the teaching behind it. So, um, yeah, face value of these doesn't look real inviting, but when we get down to the, the root of it, then we, we understand it better. So uh, it's encouragement then for us to, or eye-opening for us to, to be able to dig into Scripture. Uh, question 8, looking at verse 20. Just what does it mean to be poor? And from verse 24, what does it mean to be rich? So verse 20, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. And then uh, verse 24, but woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. So just to kind of get the question out of the way, uh, 
Is it okay to be rich and be a Christian? Or is it okay to be a Christian and be rich? I should say it that way. Yes. Yeah, it is. This is not a teaching against having material wealth. Um, put this kind of in a different, or a, uh, just to spin that a little bit. If we're a Christian and we happen to be rich, is it right for us to be very closed-fisted with the wealth that we have? Uh, you know, God blesses us with that in, in, in order for us to be able to turn around and, and bless individuals with it too. Uh, so I think there's a responsibility there to, be, to not let um, uh, wealth dictate our life. But, but when we see a need, a God, a God need, then, then we have to be open with that. But Christ is speaking more than just about material things here. Uh, so, so look at verse 20. What does it mean to be poor? And then what does it mean to be rich out of 24? Let's say if you're poor, you're seeking after things. You want okay. things because you're not satisfied. Okay. That's what you have. You want more. You want better. So in this sense, it's talking about seeking after God or the knowledge that Scripture provides. Or in this <clears> case, being around Christ and listening to His teachings provides. So people who are poor seek more of that and want more. And people who are rich oftentimes they're satisfied with what they have or they're content and don't feel like they necessarily need anything. So in this sense, it's talking about the rich are not blessed. They've received the reward now. They have what they want. But the poor are still seeking after something more, something better. So their reward is coming. So to kind of put it in a little bit of, of terms today, um, if if we go to our pantry or whatever wherever you store it and we look and there's absolutely no toilet paper right now then we're going to be going and trying to search for that toilet paper because we feel like we've got to have some more um, but if we go there and there's tons of rolls in there we kind of sit back and we say you know I don't really need to be looking for any right now uh, which is kind of the way Christ is speaking here about you know, when he speaks of poor it's kind of this emptiness that we know needs to be filled. And uh, kind of like your storage pantry with toilet paper, you know it needs to be filled. But, but we know it needs to be filled with, with uh, God's Word, with Scripture, with encouragement from Him, with guidance from Him. Going back to that prayer we talked about earlier, just direction from Him as well. We know when we're poor, we know that we need something else that's not there. Is this an experience today? No, no, okay. we're good. We're good. Um, so, uh, looking then at, at just kind of some of those sub questions under question eight, are we um, are we tempted to rely on riches? So, just as our human nature, uh, especially in the United States, the culture that we have, it's it's easy for us to fall into that category where we rely on wealth or riches, and we think if we have those things, then we're we're in good shape. And then. Along with it, are we dulled to our need by our plenty? So uh, when we, again, when we go and we see that there's 20 rolls of toilet paper in there, we think, oh, we're good. But uh, so we're dulled to our need, and the, the need here, of course, we're talking spiritual. And, and when we look around our house and maybe we see a lot of Bibles sitting there, that doesn't mean that, that we still don't have a need to put that in our heart. Um, but because of our plenty of Bibles sitting around our home, we may think we're okay. Also say that just because you've been a Christian for years or the majority of your life doesn't mean that you're good or that you've reached a point where you have plenty or where you're done or where your That's race right. is over. As long as we're still on earth, we're still called to learn and be active in the discipling process. That's a good point. Very good point. And then that last bullet point there, are we proud of what we have done or do we take credit for our comforts? Those are kind of the same question, just trying to put it in two different perspectives. <clears throat> I think if we're not careful, we do tend to, to take credit for the things that we have or the comforts that we have, what we've done. Uh, we can somewhat develop this, this pride of, of accomplishment there. And, and you know, there, there is some fulfillment in us um, working and and um, and providing for a family, that kind of thing. But we also have to always remember that those things come from God, and we can never lose sight of, of that in our life. Otherwise, then we become prideful in the wrong way, and that pride is that, that we try to realize, or we try to think that 
that we're self-sufficient without him. I'd say that partially pride is a good thing, though. I mean, when God created Adam, he gave him a job. That was one of the first things he did. He tasked him with naming the animals and taking care of the garden. So God created us with a desire to work, and we do find fulfillment in that work, and we're supposed to. Mm -hmm. But it can be taken to the extreme when you rely on that only for your fulfillment or your excitement or your contentment. That's not where we're supposed to look, but that is an aspect of it. And I think that's where to prevent that from happening, when we get up in the morning, we have to be thankful that He's given us our breath that day. He's given us the ability to move around. He's given us the, the strength to be able to get up and do that work. And, and when we remember those things, then it tends to take that pride away because we're relying on God again, not our own strength. All right, question nine. From the first part of verse 21, what does it mean to be hungry? And from verse 25, what does it mean to be full? That's uh, kind of like what Matthew was saying earlier. To be hungry is to want to know more about Jesus, to seek to have a closer relationship, whereas to be full is to be satisfied with where you're at, to be comfortable, which is not good in the life of a Christian. Okay. There was uh, an example I read about a, I was talking about a, a uh, ducks that were flying north, and it was kind of a, a fairy tale example. But ducks are flying north for the winter, and, and one happens to land in this barnyard where where uh, tame ducks are, and there's corn laying all out on the ground, so he begins to eat it, and uh, he stays there for for a couple of hours, and then you know he's getting some good corn here, so he ends up staying, and he ends up staying all winter there. And um, as his flock is flying back south, he hears them, and he decides he's going to try to take off. And so he uh, realizes that because he stayed there and he's filled his belly full, uh, he hasn't exercised his wings, and, and the highest he can fly is to the top of the barn. That's as far as he could get. So he decides, so I'll just wait, and I'll meet up with him next time. So he goes back down to the barnyard. And, and then the next time they fly by, he hears them, but he thinks, you know, I've got it pretty good here, and he, he doesn't even try to, to fly off. And then the next time they fly by, he doesn't even acknowledge them at all. And so he gets to the point where he has no hunger to be with them because he's filling himself with stuff that's really not, not good for him in the long run. And, and we can find ourselves kind of doing that if we're not cautious of, of we ignore God's Word to a point that, that we just kind of push back from it and we say we're doing okay you know, where we are. And, and it's not an immediate thing. Typically, it's kind of this slow process, kind of like the duck there, kind of the slow process of just fading away from it. And, and so Christ says you know, here, he says, we're blessed when we're hungry. When we're striving to know more about God's Word, then, then, then we're blessed. All right, question 10 uh, from the last part of verse 21. What does it mean to weep now? And from the last of verse 25, what does it mean to laugh now? So one of the, um, one of the things that we see in Christ's life is he actually mourned over Jerusalem because he wished that they would have listened to the prophets, that they would have listened to him, that they would have um, accepted him. And uh, they didn't do that, and so he weeps over them. We find today that, that people weep over things in this world, but it's not always the right things that we weep over. Um, we laugh about things in this world, but it's not always the right things that we laugh about. Uh, we should find joy in seeing someone accept Christ as their Savior, ask Christ to be their Savior, and, and to be baptized. This should be a time of great joy for us. Um, but sometimes what we find is that, that we see sinful things acted out on TV in front of us and we tend to laugh at them because we see it as TV and it's not really happening, it's just out there. But we laugh at, at the sinful things and then when we get into church and we see someone uh, be saved or, or get baptized then we don't really find much joy in that. And so we get our priorities mixed up about those things. And so Christ says, you know, Blessed are those who weep now. If we weep over someone who is not saved, that's the right thing to be weeping over. Um, and if we find joy on someone who comes to know Christ, then, then it's the right thing to be finding joy on. If 
you look at that next statement. Oh, go ahead. I would say this kind of goes along with um, what Paul talks about in Romans 9 too, um, where he's discussing um, the Jews and the Gentiles, and he's addressing issues that have come up. And one of the issues that he was discussing was about um, it, the term he used was Israel, and he said not all of Israel is a part of Israel. And it was kind of a con mm -hmm. conflicting verse or something that people don't understand necessarily. And when you look at it, he's talking about there's a spiritual Israel and then Israel. And that spiritual Israel was weeping, and they were sad because there were others who had not accepted Christ as a Messiah. And they, find, they found contentment and joy and satisfaction in their relationship with Christ then, but they knew that more was to come and that it was going to be better. So they knew that better times were ahead. Like it talks about that we will laugh one day if we weep now. Mm -hmm. But the Israel that it was talking about in the physical sense, talk, Paul talks about how not everyone was included in that spiritual Israel because they thought they were good enough. They thought they followed the law and that was it. That's all they had to do. And they didn't accept Christ as the Messiah or look to follow him. And that's kind of that, what we were talking about laugh now, how they just thought it was fine and they were good enough and didn't see the need for Christ or the need for a relationship with him. Yeah. That, that next um, question there says, what did Charles Spurgeon mean when he stated some preachers he had known appeared to have their neckties twisted around their souls? And um, he had to kind of know the background of that to, to really know what he was speaking into. But what, what uh, Spurgeon was talking about was that there were preachers who would get up and they were so extremely solemn that there was absolutely no type of a smile or laughter that would occur even while they were presenting the gospel. And, and he said, you know, there's, there's no joy in that. And, and so he said it seemed as though their, their soul was just being squelched by their necktie. And I think, you know, in our church today, of course, we're not able to meet right now, and, and we look forward to when we can again because we want to be able to laugh together again. Uh, we want to be able to weep together again over the souls who are not saved. But we also want to rejoice in, in those who have chosen to become saved and be baptized and those type things. And, um, and, and it's good to have laughter within the church, laughter for the right reason within the church, because it does bring joy to, to us. And Proverbs 17, 22 kind of gives us that, that, uh, that understanding as Solomon speaks. And he says... Um, a joyful heart is good medicine, but a crushed spirit dries up the bones. And, you know, even now in this time period we're kind of going through, some laughter out there is some good things. And it does kind of lift the soul as well. Uh, verse or Question 13 says from verse 22, How important is the last seven words of the verse on account of the Son of Man? So uh, uh, when you look at that, that verse... Uh, it says, blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and revile you and spurn your name as evil. On a, And then if you, if you stopped right there and you didn't have these last seven words that says, on account of the Son of Man, then you could go through life thinking that as long as people hate me, I'm blessed. But, but he adds that in. It changes the meaning. It does. It does. And, and so those last seven words are, are really important uh, in order for us to understand that we're not to go out and just try to make people hate us. But if someone does hate us because we're trying to present Christ to them, that's okay because we've tried to present Christ. Now, there's, we've talked about it some before, there's, there's a right way to present and a wrong way. And if I try to beat you over the head with it and tell you, you know, point my finger in your face and say you're going to hell if you don't accept it, um, I'm probably not going to be hated for the right reason. I'm going to be hated for my presentation of it not for the message actually that's there. I'd say that those last seven words also kind of teach of the importance of reading the entirety of a passage of Scripture and not just picking out one particular verse or statement or one brief chapter. You have to read and understand the context of it and read the full thing so that you know what's truly meant by it and you're not misled or misguided. Yeah, yeah there's definitely value in, in and we find that happen today, that sometimes people, they, they pull out a verse or a piece of a verse even, and, uh, and they do that to try to prove their point. And we need to look at the context of what it's spoken into, the people group it's spoken into, and uh, what's being addressed at that point in time. Um, 14 says, true disciples, even though they are poor, hungry, weeping, and are rejected, are what? 
blessed. And they're blessed. And it's just kind of the, the sum, summary of this uh, passage here. I want to leave us with a note here, a quote from Oswald Chambers. And he says, God can achieve his purpose either through the absence of human power and resources or the abandonment of reliance on them. So basically, God doesn't have to have humans to get done what he needs to get done. But he can achieve it through humans if we'll just get out of the way and not rely on our own strength. It says, all through history, God has chosen and used nobodies because their unusual dependence on him made possible the unique display of his power and grace. He chose and used somebodies only when they renounced dependence on their natural abilities and resources. You know, the more that we can understand about being blessed by by realizing that we are empty and we need to be fed by the Word, by having that hunger to be fed by, by the Word, by praying as Christ prayed, um, by listening to the Holy Spirit, the more that we can accept those things in our life and understand we need them, the more that we can set aside our own ability of just thinking, I can do this, just get out of my way, I'm going to do it, then uh, the better that God will be uh, promoted in this world, or um, promoted maybe is not the, the best way of saying that, but glorified. the more glorified he'll be. That's that's a better way of saying it. The more glorified he will be in that. So any last thoughts? I would say that's a theme that we see throughout Scripture, Old and New Testament, about God using the nobodies as it was termed in this quote. Um, even if you go back to Abraham, you see him and his wife were yeah. beyond the age, even at that time, beyond the age of having kids or where it was normal to have a kid. Moses had a speech impediment. Yeah. He was used to free the slaves. And was a murderer. Oh, true. <laughs> see. It's, yeah, it's nothing. It's nothing. Don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, he, he does, and, and we talked, you mentioned. got an Egyptian in their closet. <laughs> You uh, you mentioned um, David earlier, you know David being the run of the bunch almost. Um, no one thought he would be the guy, but yet he was. And so God does use those nobodies. And and sometimes you know you take someone like Paul. Now Paul was a guy that that actually was pretty prominent. And but Paul after that Damascus Road experience, he put himself out of the way, and he he actually said that he had to die to self daily, uh, in order to prevent that pride from taking over and. And him realizing that it's God, not him. I mean, actually, see, he lived out the Beatitudes. He did suffer and mm-hmm. weep and all of those things mm-hmm. um, because of his faith in Christ. But then he spoke about the joy that he had and about the fulfillment that he had and about the benefit of living his life for Christ after he changed. And, and a lot of the joy that he found was actually in seeing people um, believe in Christ and continue living their life in Christ. And that was where Paul found his joy. You know, even when imprisoned, he was able to write letters talking about the joy that he had in hearing of what the people had done and, and how they had uh, continued the work even while he was, you know, in prison. So that's the that's the, that laughter or joy that we talk about versus the weeping that we talk about. All right, anything else? All right, well, we appreciate you joining us tonight. And as always, if you have any questions, you feel free to get in touch with me, especially if you want to discuss anything about the Word. Uh, just text me. Uh, if we didn't answer a question or, or you didn't have the chance to get it, uh, then text me and we'll try to get it answered for you. So we appreciate you joining in with us, though. Again, we look forward to being able to be back in front of you and, and to uh, weep with you, but also to, to uh, be joyful with you as well. So thanks for tuning in. And until we see you again. Have a blessed